crash vortex, a surprise at sea. Captain Charles Moore felt the wind across the North Pacific Ocean die to a whisper. A few weeks earlier, it had filled the sails of the Aguita, pushing the white 50-foot-long, 15-meter-long sailboat west from California to Hawaii in the 1997 Trans-Pacific Yacht Race. He carried a trophy for third place and was enjoying brisk winds pushing him and his crew back home to California. Until now. Moore had scanned weather reports and turned the Aguita's bow southeast. It had entered an expanse of ocean that was still as a paint was as still as a painting. Sailors usually try to avoid the North Pacific Ocean. The weather there is not too stormy or unpredictable, but too calm. Legends tell of desperate sailors waiting so long for wind that they had to conserve drinking water by drowning their cargo of livestock. Sailors and scientists now understand that this quiet expanse of ocean is the center of a gyre, a gyre, a whirlpool that is thousands of miles wide. Powerful currents flow around the outer edges like rivers through the ocean. Driven by the wind and the Earth's rotation, the currents sweep west across the Pacific Ocean and up the coast of Asia. Then they move east across the ocean, down the west coast of North America, and west to begin the cycle again. The water encircled by the currents turns clockwise sluggishly. Moore's modern sailboat was equipped with diesel engines, a system to make seawater drinkable, and a radio to call for help. Even so, a detour across these calm waters would haunt him. It would convince him that the ocean held a danger so great that it threatened the survival not only of his crew, but of organisms all over the globe. On August 8, while standing on deck, Moore saw something unexpected. Here and there, odd bits and flakes speckle the ocean's surface. He later wrote in the book, Plastic Ocean, how, sea ca how a sea captain's chance discovery launched a determined quest to save the oceans. He was disturbed because the objects were plastic. He said it looked as if giant salt shaker has sprinkled bits of plastic onto the surface of the ocean. Each day he scanned the water and found that no matter the time of day or how many times a day I look, it's never more than a few minutes before I see a plastic morsel bobbing by. A bottle here, a cap there, scraps of plastic film, fragments of rope or fishing net, broken down bits of former things. For seven days, the Aguida traveled more than a thousand miles, with more noticing that they were always there. Plastic shards fluttering like last lost moths on the surface waters of the deep remote ocean. Moore returned to the Alamitos Bay, California where he had spent his youth swimming, surfing, and sailing in the Pacific Ocean. By the 1980s, he wrote pollution of many kinds, made residents think twice about eating a fish they caught off the pier. Now he wrote that he could not stop thinking about all those miles and days of plastic. Over the decades, we'd gotten used to the sight of trash on the beach, by the roadside, roadsides and in the riverbeds, the shopping bags fluttering on fences and branches, but something seemed very wrong about this plastic trash in the middle and mid-Pacific. He wanted to know why it was there. Oceanographer Curtis Ebsmeyer offered more an explanation. Since the 1990s, Ebsmeyer had studied how plastic trash moves through the ocean. He depended on a network of volunteers to report what trash washed up on shores. When containers of manufactured goods slipped off ships, Ebsmeyer mapped the travels of their buoyant plastic cont contents to the beaches around the world. In 1992, an accidental spill of thousands of plastic bath toys in the Pacific Ocean sent yellow ducks washing up along the U.S. West Coast and Hawaii. We always knew this gyre existed, Ebsmeyer said, but until the ducks came along, we didn't know how long it would take to complete a circuit. For more than a decade, ducks traveled and landed on the shores of South America, Europe, Australia, and even the Arctic. Ebsmeyer realized that the 11 gyres in the world's oceans, along with the ocean currents, work together like a giant conveyor belt, circulating seawater and everything floating in it. 
Ebsmeyer convinced Moore that Ajiri's slow-moving water does not simply carry plastic bits of trash. It creates them. First, Ajiri's currents work with a toilet bowl effect of dragging the debris from the rim and bringing it into the center, Moore said. But it never flushes. It just keeps adding and adding. In this trash vortex, plastic trash remains trapped for years. Under the sun's ultraviolet rays, plastic turns pale and brittle. It breaks apart in the salty water as waves jostle it endlessly. Gyrus slowly shred plastic into bits called microplastics. More than 90% of the plastic sea might be smaller than a grain of rice. The plastic at the sea might be smaller than a grain of rice. Ebsmeyer has estimated that a one liter plastic bottle crumbles into enough pl microplastic pieces to put one on every square mile of the world's beaches. A portrait of plastic. Plastic trash in the North Pacific gyre is now visible from space. While surveying the zone from an aircraft, researcher Boyan Slat was dismayed to see debris everywhere. Every half second, you see something. It was impossible to record anything, everything. It was bizarre to see so much garbage in what should be pristine ocean. But locating the nearly invisible microplastics in the ocean takes computer modeling, software, and a lot of patience. Researchers sail into, into the gyres with nets called trawls that drag behind their boats. The nets skim the surface, collecting microplastics. Researchers count the microplastics caught in the tiny mesh with the help of tweezers and sometimes with a microscope. Computer technicians combine new data and thousands of measurements of microplastics collected since the 1970s with information about currents to create maps of where microplastics could be floating. But the maps are only guesses. Vast parts of the ocean have not been sampled, especially in the Southern Hemisphere. What's more, floating plastic Plastic accounts for only 1% of the plastic that enters the oceans. So much of the plastic's ocean journey remains a mystery. We must learn more about the pathway and the ultimate fate of the missing plastic, said marine ecologist Andres Cesar Cambanes. Moore was restless, not for more racing trophies, but for answers. He always had been in 19, he always had been. In 1994, he had founded the Agalita Marine Research Foundation, an organization to help clean up polluted coastal water. When he helped design the Agulita, he equipped the sailboat with a laboratory to analyze water samples. Armed with nets, he and a small crew sailed back to the North Pacific Jiry in 1999, searching for what Moore called the unseen blanket of granular plastics covering the ocean surface that Ebsmeyer believed was there. Some plastic trash was easy to find. Moore observed that similar objects find each other in the middle of millions of square miles of seemingly empty ocean, and the ocean stitches them together, making a grotesque hole. We dive around this strange mass, avoiding the undulating tendrils of rope and net and deciding if it could make a convincing sci-fi monster. Elsewhere in the gyre, they found bobbing bleach bottles, shoes, toothbrushes, bottle caps, sour cream containers, soda bottles, umbrella handles, and soccer balls. Moore knew that the gyre would eventually turn this trash into plastic fragments. Using fine mesh nets, Moore's crew skimmed the ocean's surface for nearly 100 miles, 161 kilometers. The nets are designed to catch plankton, tiny organisms that provide food for marine animals of all sizes, from sardines to whales. The samples captured in the nets were both amazing and disturbing, said Moore. Not one is free of plastic. Plankton formed a jelly-like mask, mass, but it was sprinkled with plastic chips. The crew filled 11 jars with samples that resembled glass snowballs swirling with multicolored plastic snow, Moore wrote. Moore hauled home barnacle and algae-covered plastic garbage from the three-week voyage. He displayed it in the Aguilita's deck for journalists to photograph. But Moore's attention was on the gyre sample jars, headed for the laboratory. If our results are what we think, they'll be, we'll, be, we'll make noise and be heard. Good people will be moved to action, he wrote. 
Technicians painstakingly separated the natural from human-made materials and weighed them. The results were astounding. The microplastics in the samples weighed six times as much as the plankton. I wasn't the first to be disturbed about the plastic trash in the ocean, and I wasn't the first to study it, said Moore. But maybe I was the first to freak out about it. He said his new data showed that the debris was like a ticking time bomb. The data would show people that their ocean is turning into a plastic stew. If they knew, they might begin to see plastics in a new way. Maybe handle them more carefully. Maybe begin to make different choices. At first, scientists were skeptical of studies by the self-taught scientists. But like the wind filling sails, journalists swept by the dramatic story into the public eye. A Pulitzer Prize winning series in the Los Angeles Times included Moore's findings in 2006. Headlines called the polluted gyre the world's largest dump. The name Great Pacific Garbage Patch caught on. The public did not fully understand what Moore had found. When he described the plastic-stricken area as being twice the size of Texas, people imagined an island of plastic garbage that you could walk on, said Moore's colleague, Marcus Erickson. Moore exclaimed that the gyre is more like a soup, lightly seasoned with plastic flakes, bolts out here and there with dumplings, buoys, net clumps, floats, crates. People did not fully understand the danger either. The public sees an island of trash. They picture this giant place that you can go visit, Erickson said. It's much worse than that. And that concludes our chapter one reading of Trash Vortex.